best part about growing up in the 1980s in rural Zimbabwe is that I had absolutely no idea that we were poor. <laughs> These are the days before Facebook, before MTV Cribs, and before the Kardashians. <laughs> As little kids, our dreams and imaginations seemed to be bounded by the big mountains that surrounded our village. We did not know what we did not have, and we were very happy. I am the seventh of 11 children, and like most Africans, I grew up on a small farm. This year is the first picture of me. Yes, that is me on the far right, looking super cute, but sli slightly more nourished. <laughs> and this here is the place that I call home. This is a farm that I grew up at. My parents still farm this small, same three-acre piece of land. Boy, I have such fond memories of working in those fields and playing in those mountains with my best friends, Thomas and Wilfred. Fast forward 20 years. I just finished my PhD in Agricultural Economics at Cornell University, and I went back home to Zimbabwe in uh, December of 2003. There's nothing like being at home for the holiday seasons. The whole village always feels like one happy family reunion. So that year after church service at Christmas, I headed down to the local grocery store that also doubled as a village bar over the holidays. <laughs> By the time I got there, there was already a small crowd of young men dancing to loud music, catching up on local gossip. So I found a good spot to sit down in a corner with my uh, three brothers, and we got about just enjoying some warm drinks. After a while, I'm sitting there and I see this older man with slightly torn clothes, worn clothes, walking towards me. So I got up, I greeted him, and wished a Merry Christmas and Happy New Year. Just before I turned over to my brothers to continue my conversation, this man taps me on the shoulder and says, Ed, it's me, Thomas, remember me? What, Thomas? My childhood friend Thomas from primary school? I tried very hard to cover this look of shock on my face. He looked much older and weathered. So, very quickly, I exchanged our own secret childhood handshake with him that I still remembered. <laughs> I won't share with you because I swore to secrets when I was 10. <laughs> and then I invited him to sit down and catch up on this business that we call life. See, Thomas told me then that life had not been too kind to him. He still lived in the nearby village, and he had a couple of goats, and he farmed a small piece of land just to get by. Thomas already had five children, and he was especially proud of his oldest daughter, Naomi, who he said was very athletic. Every year, Thomas and his family barely harvested enough to feed themselves. And he told me that every day, he prayed for a better life for his children. In so many ways, Thomas' life was exactly like that of his parents and probably like that grand his grandparents before them. Nothing had changed. That night as I went to bed, I could not sleep. I was bothered by this question of how our lives had turned out to be so different. Here is a guy that I literally sat next to in primary school and our lives were so different, so far apart. Had I just been lucky while Thomas had been unlucky? Was all this random without rhyme and reason? Or maybe this was God's will, I thought to myself. But while God's will felt like a very comforting explanation for my circumstances, it did not feel like a fair explanation for Thomas and his children. More importantly, as a development economist now with a degree from Cornell University, I was looking for some kind of rational explanation to explain the lives of my classmates who were still living in the village versus those of us that had somehow made it out. So after quite some reflection and analysis, I came to the realization that in my village, the, suc the successful families were also some of the best farmers. These are farmers who had gone beyond producing just enough to feed the family to making the most out of their land. With the extra produce that they were able to produce on their farms, they were able to sell it in nearby city markets, make a little bit of extra money, 
And with that income, they were able to invest it in their children's education. This is how I made it out of my village. Now, this story is not unique to me and my village. There's more than two billion farmers around the world who derive their livelihoods from smallholder agriculture. Unfortunately, these are also some among the poorest people in the world. For most of these people, agriculture is not just a way of life. It is quite possibly the only pathway out of poverty. If I'm to pick one single thing that probably triggered this transformation for my family, it would be when my parents decided to plant hybrid maize seed, or hybrid corn as it is known here in the US. Once they tried this technology and saw its power, they were simply not turning back. What I am holding in my hand right now is quite possibly the most powerful and most innovative technology known in agriculture. Yes, in the great spirit of unveiling amazing technologies at TEDx events, <laughs> this, my friends, let me just call it Hunger Buster 2.0. This is improved seed. I call it improved seed just to distinguish it from regular seed that is recycled from year to year. In this improved seed here is genetic information or software that tells the plant exactly what to do when it grows up so it can feed all of us. It's quite simply an amazing technology and sometimes we take it for granted. In this seed, we have the power to increase yield on the same unit of land. Yes, there are so many other things that you can do, such as irrigation and fertilizer, but the upper limit of what you can harvest as a farmer is set by something that is inside that seed. That's maximum genetic potential. Fortunately for us, plant breeders have done an excellent job over the last century, and we've been able to raise that bar all the way. In improved seed, we can now encode the climate change adaptability in our crops. Yes, there's a whole new generation of climate smart varieties that are designed to withstand extreme weather such as drought, flooding, frost, and wind. We call them climate smart varieties. Yes, in this seed, we can also allow plants to protect themselves against pests and diseases. We can, just like you can with vaccines, with improved seed, you can immunize your plants and crops against diseases that can wipe out your entire harvest. And lately, Breeders are also focusing on some of the needs that we have as consumers, including higher nutrition and longer shelf life. But the most amazing thing about seed is this. Farmers do not need any additional training to use it. Yes, just like that cell phone in your pocket, you don't need to know anything about how it was made to enjoy the benefits. You just put it in the soil and it grows and it performs. However, getting new varieties is just the first step. These hunger busters need to find their ways to the farmers. Some of you are, might, might be wondering now, am I talking about GMO? Actually, while I did nothing wrong with that technology, most of these things I'm talking about today are really from conventional varieties that have been around for so many years. However, this technology needs to find itself to farmers before we can actually enjoy the benefits. If you're a farmer here in the US, every year you have the chance to get this latest technology delivered right to your doorstep. However, if you're in Africa, we're looking at a different story. This here is a very simplified diagram <laughs> of what it takes. I'm not kidding at all. This is a simplified diagram of what it takes to get improved maize seed from the research institutions all the way to the smallholder farmers. In between, there's so many more players. And it's very difficult to work around a system like this. And this system here is only as strong as its weakest link. If something goes wrong on one of those points, farmers do not get their seed at the end of the year. So there's a common saying in the people that work in my field that says, it's much easier to get a, a can of ice cold Coca-Cola in an African village than to get a bag of improved seed. Yes, it is true. So what do we do about that? As a result of this complexity, only 30% of African farmers use improved seed, compared to more than 90% here in the US. If we are to transform agriculture in Africa and allow smallholder farmers to feed themselves, we have to find some way of fixing that system or identifying where the problems may be. 
I currently lead a research project called the African Seed Access Index. And what we do under this research project is we go to every African country and we look at the different crops and we try to identify 20 different indicators of performance along that seed value chain. These vary from country to country and crop by crop. This now allows us to identify the choke point along that seed delivery channel. And we can actually raise the red flag where the systems are not working well. For example, every country needs a whole new pipeline of new varieties that it can supply to its farmers to meet their challenges. What you can see in this graph is that Kenya is doing extremely well when it comes to the staple crop maize. However, when it comes to the second and third crop, cow peas, sorghum, millet, they are doing extremely poor in that. We then take this information along with other indicators, such as availability of seed in small packages, number of extension officers available to farmers, and the quality of seed policy and regulatory systems. Once we identify the critical choke points, we take this information to governments, private companies, donor organizations, and we do raise the flag that if you are to fix the seed delivery system in Africa, this is the point where you need to start. I remain convinced that improved seed has the power to unlock agricultural potential in Africa and the power to break this vicious cycle of rural poverty. How do I know that this will work? Well, there are thousands of studies that support this finding, but most importantly for me, I know that it worked for me and for my family. I know it might be too late for my best friend Thomas, but I think we have a chance to save his little daughter Naomi. Thank you. <laughs>